All right, thank you. So apps need permissions to access resources, right? We're carrying around these smartphones. They are filled with sensors, lots of personal information, and we want to make sure that any app that gets installed doesn't get full reign of the device. So we have this permission system on Android where apps have to request a permission, and if the user grants the permission or installs the app and by doing so grants the permission, apps can access these resources. Now, there's a lot of legitimate criticism of the Android permission system. It's not perfect. There's a lot of problems with it, and apps tend to overreach in the permissions they may not necessarily need. But nevertheless, it is the case that they serve an important purpose. And at the very least, we would want the permission system to be sound in that if an app is denied a permission, it should not be able to access any of the resources that that permission protects. Right? We want this soundness because if we don't have this soundness, then we don't have a real permission system even with other issues that may exist with it. However, as we know in security, a security mechanism can often be circumvented or avoided. Here in the physical world, we see a security mechanism and evidence of some circumvention that is occurring around it. And the same thing can happen in our digital systems. And two examples of such are known as covert channels and side channels. So a covert channel involves two apps. Here we have Alice app and Bob app. And there's a bunch of sensitive resources, sensors, actions, and data, and they're being protected by some security mechanism. And the security mechanism allows Alice to access the sensitive resources, but denies Bob access. And a covert channel is a communication channel between the Alice app and the Bob app, where in effect Alice uses her privilege with the security mechanism as a front for Bob, allowing Bob to get access, communicating via the covert channel that is not monitored by the security mechanism. A side channel involves just one app. Here we have Eve app. She is also denied access through the security mechanism, but there exists some side channel to access the same information. Maybe another way of accessing the same information or information that's similar, just as good, just as useful. The point is that this side channel is not monitored by the security mechanism, and therefore whatever policy that should be enforced is not being enforced by it. So in this work, we searched for evidence of side and covert channels actually being used in practice and then figured out what those channels are. So we looked for evidence that was consistent with the use of side and covert channels and then figured out exactly what was happening. So visually, our method is the following. We start with a large corpus of apps and we use static analysis to determine all of the data that these apps can access. Because in Android, the permission model is such that you have to declare the permissions you want ahead of time. If you're going to use location, you need to claim effectively at compile time that you're going to use location. And that means that we can look at an app and figure out exactly what information that app is allowed to access. And we get a report of all of that information. Then we use a dynamic analysis framework to actually run all these apps, run lots and lots and lots of apps in real time on real phones while we're monitoring the network traffic, doing TLS interception, looking at all of the data that's going anywhere out on the internet. And the result of that is we get a lot of reports about what data was actually sent out, which apps sent out your location, which apps sent out your IMEI. And we may have missed some things because there could be obfuscations, and we certainly found plenty of obfuscations that we then added to our corpus to help find more transmissions of it, such information. But in general, we have these, now these two pieces of data, the data that was sent and the data that was allowed to be accessed. We do a set minus, and we find a bunch of transmissions of data for which the app did not have the permission to actually access it in the first place. We see an app sending the IMEI out somewhere on the internet, but it didn't have the read phone state permission. How did that happen? So that's the next part, which was a tedious reverse engineering of all of these apps to figure out exactly how these transmissions occurred. And the result of this was a bunch of reports of side and covert channels. That is the work that we present right now. So in summary, we are looking for evidence consistent with the use of side and covert channels by running all these apps dynamically. We get actual evidence of these occurring in practice while we did our experiments. This is what our experimental test bed looked like. We've been doing this since 2017. Now we're a little nicer. We have a little cooling station, powered USB hubs. But in effect, we're just running these apps on phones, looking at all of the network traffic and seeing what's going on. The headline finding 
is that SDKs are to blame. These software development kits that get included, these third-party libraries that get included in apps to do things like ad, ads and analytics, they could do game engine things, they could just be useful libraries to interact better with some other interfaces. These are the things that we found most responsible for sending out personal information. And the interesting thing about SDKs is that they inherit their permissions from the app. So the same code, the same SDK can find itself in two different apps with different sets of permissions, and it does not have any control over what permissions it ultimately gets. It's up to the app to select the permissions. The SDK simply inherits them. So in an app, it may have location, it may behave differently as a result of that. It also helped with our reverse engineering because now we only needed to reverse one example of an app that was sending some particular information to some particular destination on the internet because that destination on the internet corresponded to an SDK that we could reverse engineer, find out how they were doing it, and then fingerprint the malicious code, searching for it in other SDKs and be able to, in, in a sense, measure this prevalence at large. So to show you this visually, we have a whole bunch of apps. We have some third party on the internet, and we, through our dynamic analysis, find some of them sending the IMEI to this third party on the internet. And there may be a third one as well. It's sending the IMEI as well, but it has the read phone state, so we don't flag it as suspicious. We reverse engineer one of the apps. We find this malicious code that's actually responsible for this transmission, fingerprint this malicious code. We can now find it in these other apps as well. And then we can even search through all of the apps in our corpus, and maybe we find the same malicious code. It just wasn't expressed. It didn't happen to occur. Maybe it never will. There's issues with static analysis, and that's why we prefer doing dynamic analysis so we get real evidence that these occurred in practice. And to just show that again, we have a dynamic bound. We can, with this, say at least eight apps do this. We saw this when we did our experiments with a static bound. We could say, well, at least Y apps have the code. They could do this. There could be more, but we have no evidence they actually will ever run this code. And so that's why the dynamic bounds will be much smaller, but it corresponds to actual evidence. So two highlights I want to present from this work. The first one is that the Chinese company Baidu uses external storage as a covert channel. And so if you, if you think about the Covert Channel, these are two apps communicating with each other. And they just use the SD card, which is probably the simplest Covert Channel you can think of. There's shared storage on the device. You can, any app can read from it or write to it if they have the read and write external storage permission. So what does Baidu do? In the slash SD card slash backup slash dot system config slash dot CUID, they store a base64 encoded object. When you unbase64 it, it doesn't make any sense. It's all binary. And so that's where the reverse engineering comes in. And we find somewhere in the code, there is a call to AES, and there's a fixed key and a fixed IV. They're both the same value. It doesn't look like it looks like an encryption key, but when you reverse it, it says Baidu CID. So it looks like they've been doing this since about 2012. They then use this to encrypt this object on the SD card. So once they get the bytes of it, that's the key that they used. When we were decrypting it, then we could actually see it's a JSON object storing the hash of our Android ID and as well the IMEI of the phone. And the way this side channel or the covert channel works is that if one app doesn't have the read phone state permission, it can read this file, get the IMEI, and send it off to Baidu. Whereas if another app has the read phone state permission, it can get the IMEI and write it for other apps to use. And that's exactly what we saw when we did our experiments. When we looked at the prevalence in our, in our data set, we found 153 apps had the encryption key. So they had this fixed string that we could search for. And of them, 73 sent the IMEI. But of course, many of these may have had legitimate access to the IMEI because they requested the read phone state permission. So in the sense of these 153, we found only 20 that didn't have the IMEI permission. Of those, eight actually sent the IMEI out. So they actually used this co so or side channel between other apps to get the IMEI and send it away. And one of those is made by Disney. It's the Disney Hong Kong Disney World app. And the point I want to make here is that Disney is a big company, and this kind of behavior is not good behavior. This is a, to me, it seems a bit deceptive practice because they're claiming they don't have the read phone state permission, and yet they're accessing and sending the IMEI. And if Disney is making apps that do this, this is a problem with SDK, with trust in SDKs in general. And while it's not that many apps, they correspond to 700 million installations. 
So that's a lot of installations, even if it's a small number of apps, because you have to look at the prevalence of the app, not how many apps are in fact affected. The second highlight, the American company Unity, it produces a game engine, ad engine, uh, analytics, and stuff like that. They use iOctals as a side channel. If you don't know what an iOctal is, it's just a low-level uh, input-output control. It a, allows a rich space of API functionality that's not typically used very often, and as a result, it wasn't pr properly protected on Android. And in particular, they used the uh, socket iOctal get interface hardware address, which gets the MAC address of the device, of the phone itself. Why are they interested in the MAC address? It's a very persistent identifier, just like the IMEI of the device. Unity sends the hash of the MAC address, and they call it the UUID, Universally Unique Identifier, presumably in the JSON transmission that they send. And you can't reset your MAC address. It survives factory resets. It survives flashing the phone. The only way to do it is to root your phone and install MAC changing software, and no one is doing that, not at the consumer level. So it allows tracking of users against all possible changes, against opt-outs, and all sorts of things like that. So we saw 711 apps sending the MAC address to Unity server. And of those, 42 sent it without the corresponding permission, which is access network state. Now this is from our paper. We since realized that when we did all of our experiments on Marshmallow, on the Marshmallow version of Android, they do not allow any access to the Wi-Fi MAC address, meaning that all 711 of these transmissions were done using the iOctal as a side channel that should not have been allowed under the Android permission model. Um, we found 12,000 that actually had this code or code corresponding to error strings that occurred if the iOctal failed. However, most of them, thankfully, were not actually exploiting this uh, iOctal side channel. Only 711 we actually observed sending this in practice. However, this 711 corresponds to 2 billion installations on the planet according to Google Play metadata. So again, quite a problem indeed. Other findings from our paper, which I encourage you to read, we found one app was sending all of your EXIF metadata, and as a result included your geolocation. This was the Shutterfly app, and we just noticed this outgoing transmission of location and figured out how they were doing it. Another app was getting the router MAC address by connecting to 192.168.0.1 and just asking for plug and play information. Another one was reading the OS's ARP cache. It just read the file slash proc slash net slash ARP, and in there could find the MAC address of the router, which is a surrogate for location. Limitations of our study, we focused on a subset of permissions. So we didn't look at content providers, camera, microphone. We've been running these experiments for years, and these are things that we want to do next because there could be more interesting side and covert channels there as well. Part of our methodology required conspicuous network transmissions, meaning we had to actually see it. The evidence that we gathered that a side or covert channel was being exploited was the fact that we saw a transmission of data that the app should not have even been able to access. And there could be ways that they're obfuscating it or there could be accessing this information but not transmitting it. That is a result or that as a consequence, we just don't notice that these side or covert channels are being exploited. To run these apps automatically, we use the Android Exerciser Monkey. It's not very sophisticated. It just randomly clicks and swipes with the app. It doesn't, for instance, log into accounts. So there could be other things, other behaviors that occur if we were to log into accounts and so forth. And finally, we only looked at apps from the Google Play Store. We only considered apps that were not classified as malware, with somewhat legitimate apps that anyone can download through the Play Store. So there may be different behaviors, different side and cover channels in different sets of apps. Um, as a note, we've published all of, our, all of the apps that we found affected online, and you can find all this information on our blog, blog.appcensus.mobi. We're also publishing some stories from this, and we try to include security principles in general, sort of targeted at an undergraduate level, where we go through concepts such as brute force searching, hash functions when you have a small domain and things like that. So there could be some interesting things uh, you can find there. And so summary and some questions uh, to pr bring up. In this work, we looked for evidence of side and covert channels, and we found them. We found exploited bugs and, and covert channels being used in large, popular applications by large companies. We found that you, typically it's these SDKs that are responsible, which brings the question, how can we establish a sense of trust? How can we know which ones are safe to use? 
Um, a question that I'm not uh, the best person to discuss, but is, I want to at least mention and bring it up, does the permission system represent notice and consent? Does saying, I require these permissions, represent notice, the user installing the app represent consent, and if so, what does that mean for behaviors such as exploiting side and covert channels? In one case, we found an app that only exploited the covert channel or the side channel after it couldn't do it the legitimate way. So it tried legitimately and then exploited the side channel. Um, as a note, we received a bug bounty for our work. Google has committed to fix the issue that was eligible in version Q. It was just protecting the ARP cache slash proc slash net slash ARP. It was a change that would just be a file system permission change. And um, in some sense, it seems like privacy is then a luxury because you have to buy a brand new phone to get Q on your phone, whereas this really should just be an over-the-air update. It's not that hard to change a file system permission. Again, our disclosure and all of the information uh, as well, these stories at our blog, blog.appsensus.mobi. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions. I thank the speakers. So have you contacted Baidu and Disney about your filing, and what is their feedback? We contacted Google about the side channels that, ex or the, yeah, the side channels because they represented bugs in their code. Yeah. We didn't contact the companies that were exploiting them. Hey, Joel. Really great talk. Uh, I'm curious, how prevalent are these issues uh, across the various different versions of Android that exist in the global marketplace? Across, like, version 4, 5, 6, 7, 8? Or? Like Marshmallow, uh, whatever the latest version of Android is. I don't know. I don't actually have an Android phone. <laughs> right. So um, basically, we did all of our experiments on version M. And then that's what we were using on our experimentation. And then we were retesting them on P to when we were submitting them for the bug bounty. And the iOctal one had already been fixed by P, but the ARP cache one had not been fixed. And the use of the side or use of the storage device as a side channel or a covert channel rather is just part of the Android working as intended. And in that sense, it's up to the SDK developers to just be honest about it, right? And not and not use that. Great, thanks. A lot of these SDKs seem to be very much working in a trusted client model. Is there any potential for mischief, for example, with the external storage? You put your own encrypted blob in there, and now the app starts reporting that. Right. So you could easily have changed the file that was stored on the SD card, and it's quite possible that the code would just read it as is, decrypt it, and send it off, and whatever data was there, let's hope that they properly escaped it or it's not like attack code or something like that. Yeah. Good point. OK, we have time for another question. Any volunteer? OK, I'd like to thank the speaker again.